hello everyone so so uh, we should start right uh, people will gradually join in yeah i think we should uh, start okay good evening everyone uh, so welcome to our webinar on quali qualifying in the uk as a solicitor or barrister so uh, we have uh, paul mcconnell sir and uh, he is a qualified solicitor who practiced law internationally at an american law firm in london and paris he has taught in higher education for 15 years and is passionate about about employability and supporting international students with their study and career choices thank you for being here sir today and uh, over to you thank you very much it's a pleasure to be here and thank you to everyone who's joined us for the webinar so just to begin with a general introduction as was explained i was originally a solicitor practicing for a number of years in the field of corporate law both in london paris and then most recently birmingham after a number of years in legal practice though i decided to make a move into legal education so i'm now a member of the teaching staff at birmingham law school in the uk I'm also the law school's head of global engagement which means that I'm responsible for liaising with lawyers and law students around the world and speaking to them about opportunities. Linking to that I'm also the law school's head of careers and employability. So I'm hopeful that I can give you lots of useful information based on my own experiences and experiences working with Indian colleagues and students about the legal profession and opportunities within the legal profession in the UK. The presentation itself will be split into two main sections. I'm just going to take 3 or 4 minutes giving you a little more information about Birmingham Law School and then the bulk of the session will be taken up with information about qualifying as a UK solicitor or barrister. I'm joined today by my colleague Ben Atkins who will then also conclude and provide a little more information. And between us we very much hope that we'll be able to answer all of your questions and we do welcome your questions. So if there are questions you have as we go through please do post these and at appropriate points we will respond and make sure we cover whatever specific questions you've wanted to raise. So we'll begin then with just a quick overview of Birmingham Law School in case you're not familiar with us. I thought we'd start with some pictures. That's a picture that hopefully you can see of the heart of the Birmingham campus. The law school is the building at the bottom of the screen just below the clock tower and that's where I'm normally based although due to the pandemic as you can see I'm working at home currently we we really hope that we'll be back on campus in a few weeks time though talking of the campus there's a perspective of the wider university of birmingham you can see it's a very large campus we're one of the largest universities in the uk situated in the city of birmingham in a very pleasant green suburb and just to introduce the university of birmingham we're consistently a top 100 worldwide university currently ranked 81st in the world very large with over 35000 students including 7000 students who are international students and several hundred of those international students are from india We're very proud that we were one of the founding members of the Russell Group. If you've not heard of the Russell Group, it's similar to the American Ivy League. It's the group of 24 leading English and British universities including Oxford, Cambridge and Birmingham. The UK government from time to time provides official teaching ratings of the quality of teaching at different British universities and again we're very proud that the University of Birmingham is a gold rated university which is the highest rating that can be obtained also just going back to last week we were absolutely delighted to receive a new award which i think links very well to the topic of today's talk we were ranked number 1 in the uk from over 100 universities for our graduate employability we're the number one most targeted university in the country by employers and that means of course there's a lot of opportunities for our students and hopefully i can talk to you about some of those opportunities today and how you might be able to access them finally as you can see on the slide Although we're based in Birmingham in the UK, we quite recently opened up a Dubai campus which has proved to be quite popular for students coming from India as well. 
to introduce you to the city of Birmingham, though, in case you're not familiar with us, we're the second largest city in the UK, second only to London, with around three million people in the urban area, which I know is still quite small by Indian standards. We're a very diverse international city and actually quite a high proportion of the population in Birmingham has family origins in India. We're located only an hour from London by the train and there's very good public transport. We also have an international airport with direct um, Air India flights from India. In terms of the courses that we offer, we have a whole series of undergraduate LLB law programmes and also a number of master's degrees, which are very popular with Indian students at both our Edgbaston campus, which is our Birmingham campus, the Dubai campus, and also a distance learning programme. In terms of the different masters that we offer, you can see we have a variety of different LLM programmes in Birmingham, an LLM in international commercial law in Dubai, and then a distance learning programme in energy and environmental law, which is also proving to be very popular. So I hope that gives you just a little flavour of Birmingham Law School so you can appreciate the background I come from, which is working in legal practice for a number of years, but now working in one of the UK's leading law schools in a role that combines looking at international work and liaising with international lawyers and students and also thinking about employability and graduate careers. So let's talk about that now then, thinking about qualifying in the UK as a solicitor or barrister. So I thought it would be quite a good idea just to begin with an overview of the solicitor and barrister professions. We, we hear these terms mentioned, but, but what are they and what are the differences? Well, as I said, I'm a solicitor and that's the larger of the two branches of the legal profession. We currently have around 150,000 solicitors practicing in England and Wales, which is quite a big increase over the last 10 years or so. Another positive feature is the increasing diversity of the English solicitors profession. Exactly half of solicitors are female and actually at the junior end of the profession, it's the majority of solicitors who are female. If you go to any English law school, you normally find about two thirds of the students are female and that's reflected in entry at the junior end of the legal profession. And we certainly hope to see even more diversity develop within the legal profession over the next few years. The legal profession is also ethnically diverse. Within the solicitor's side of profession, um, roughly 21% of solicitors are from Black, Asian and minority ethnic backgrounds. And that includes 10% of solicitors who have origins in the Indian subcontinent. In order to train as a solicitor, if you're going through the route of training in the UK, you would need a training contract. And just to give you some idea of the competitiveness for a training contract, there's just under 6,000 training contracts available per year on average. So when you compare that to the number of law students in British law schools, that's not actually too bad. That means one training contract to every three law students. And if you think about it, some law students will want to be barristers, some will not want to pursue legal careers and some will be looking at international legal careers outside of the UK. So on the whole, there are relatively good odds for a good candidate of successfully securing a training opportunity to qualify as a solicitor. To understand the work solicitors do, I would say it's really a bit of everything. Solicitors operate across a whole range of different legal practice areas and it's the most diverse range of work that they undertake in comparison to barristers. So typical work involves working closely with clients, giving them legal advice, undertaking legal transactions, sometimes going into court and doing advocacy if that's the field you specialise in, and really working across a whole varied range of work environments from law firms through to in-house lawyers in the business sector. Just to tell you what I used to do, I used to be a corporate solicitor. So as a solicitor, I would never go into court. I didn't do any advocacy. I did do some during my training period, but mainly my work was transactional in nature. So buying and selling companies and buying and selling real estate. So that involved negotiating on behalf of clients, preparing documentation and progressing and project managing transactions. 
that's a very big area of legal practice in the UK, transactional work. As I've said, many solicitors do also go into court and deal with things like commercial disputes or criminal or family disputes. Let's now have a look at the other branch of the legal profession, which is the barristers. This is a much smaller profession. We've got roughly 10 solicitors for every barrister. And the barrister's profession isn't quite as diverse. You can see it's a minority of barristers who are female and also a lower proportion of barristers from ethnically diverse backgrounds. There is overall a perception that the barrister's profession, rightly or wrongly, remains fairly traditional and probably harder to break into than the solicitor's profession. That's reflected in the data. We saw that you have about 6,000 training contract vacancies for solicitors every year. Nationally, in the last few years, we've looked at an average of only about 400 pupillages, as we call them, available to train as a barrister. And if you think about that in terms of the number of law students, it's quite a scary statistic. That's looking at only having one pupillage available for every 45 law students and one for every four students who focus on completing the professional training for admission to the bar. Continuing the rather bleak picture further, in the pandemic, the number of pupillage vacancies has also continued to decline. This year, we could be looking at only about 300 pupillage vacancies because a lot of court work is now happening online or not happening at all due to the difficulties around the pandemic, and that has reduced training opportunities for barristers. So in terms of what barristers do, hopefully you've already picked up on this, whereas solicitors do a wide range of work, barristers, generally speaking, are specialist advocates. Most of them will be in court most days of the week, representing clients on disputes ranging from those in the commercial field through to those around personal legal problems like criminal law, family law or inheritance law, for instance. So let's think about where this leads us, having profiled the solicitors and barristers profession. The advice I would generally give to my students at Birmingham Law School is that there will be a lot more opportunities to pursue a career in the solicitors profession. You can see how different the figures in terms of numbers of vacancies are, and it is just much more competitive to pursue a barrister career. I generally say to students, unless the only thing you've ever wanted to do is be a barrister, it would be preferable generally to explore solicitor opportunities because there, there are hundreds more opportunities available and it, it is less competitive. Also, there are factors to bear in mind, such as barristers being self-employed, so they only get paid for the work they actually do, whereas solicitors are employed and receive a, a monthly salary, um, so there's much more certainty of income. So I guess for an Indian applicant potentially looking at from barrister roles, it would be the solicitor profession that I would say is probably the best starting point. It's actually quite unusual for students from an international background to qualify as barristers. That's not to say it's not possible, but if you're looking for the smoothest route into the English legal profession, it would be the solicitor's profession that I would start with. So having given that context, let's now look at the different pathways to qualifying as a lawyer in England and Wales. And there's different pathways depending on your own situation, specifically whether you've already qualified in India or whether you haven't. So I'm going to start off with explaining the position for you if you're not a qualified advocate in India. And there's different qualification processes depending on whether you're looking to be a solicitor or a barrister. Now I'm going to start with a barrister because we've said that that's probably the less appealing route so I'll just quickly deal with that. So to be a barrister you would need an English legal qualification to start with. You would need either a recognised qualifying law degree from England or there's a law conversion you can do followed by a one-year bar course a one-year pupillage, and then you are qualified as a barrister. So you can see there why, in many respects, that's not the most accessible career for international applicants either, because you definitely have to have 
a UK qualification to start with before you can even move on to the bar course and move through the process. So we'll focus our efforts on the solicitor's profession and, and look at how that represents a bit more of an open route for international applicants. Now, the picture here is actually changing. In fact, it's changing this year. So I'm going to go through what has been the traditional route and what is going to become the new route, which is actually more accessible for international applicants. So the traditional route and the one that has applied until this year is that you would still need an English legal qualification to begin with. So you would have either a full English law degree, an undergraduate law degree, or there's a one year conversion course you can do if you've already got a, an international legal qualification. Then from your English legal qualification, you would move on to a one year postgraduate vocational course called the LPC. And you actually have to attend that course in the UK. So it takes a year of attendance and further course fees. And then you move into a training contract, as it's called, a two year period of training within a law firm. That would be paid. And as we've seen, there's around 6,000 training contract opportunities per year. At the end of the training contract, you are then admitted as a solicitor. Now, that's the traditional route that's been around for about 25 years. And that's actually the route I followed myself around 22 years ago. I, be I began going through that route. So it's a very familiar, well-established route. But there is a new route that's just come in, which I think is good news for international applicants. This new route is called the SQE, and it's available to you now. The SQE stands for Solicitor's Qualifying Exam. Under that route, you don't actually need an English legal qualification in order to embark on the process. So for example, a law degree, or in fact, any degree obtained anywhere in the world that meets certain minimum requirements, for example, an Indian law degree, would be sufficient to enable you to, to embark on this process. And what you need to do as a graduate of any discipline is just pass this assessment called the SQE. And I would say it's quite similar in concept to the sorts of bar exams you'll be familiar with maybe from other jurisdictions like the New York bar exam, for example. It's this idea you're a graduate and you do this bar exam. So telling you about the SQE, there's two parts to it which are available to any graduate. SQE1 is a large multiple choice test testing out foundations of English legal knowledge. So you're tested on all the key areas of English law and legal practice. And then SQE2 is a skills-based assessment, looking at things like your research skills, your interviewing skills, and your advocacy skills. The assessment fees themselves are around £4,000, and there's no requirement to do any course of preparation. You could, if you wished, just do the SQE assessment. And if you complete that, you're then eligible to progress through to train as a lawyer in England. Having said that, it's expected that most students would need to do a course of some sort in order to pass the SQE. It's, it's the sort of assessment that's going to be quite difficult to pass independently. But the good news is that there's lots of different options. At the more expensive end, there are face-to-face -face taught courses that you could do in the UK, but there will also be online versions of, of learning that you can do, for example, without leaving in, in India to complete your um, SQE training. The one thing I would say, though, is that for the skills assessments for the SQE, those can only be completed in England. So you would actually have to come to England to complete some of the SQE assessments. What you can see, though, is that overall, the new SQE process is a lot more open to international applicants. We're looking at a situation where your existing degree could be enough to enable you to do the SQE and potentially more flexible ways of studying that course without necessarily coming to the UK in the first instance. A second element of flexibility comes in in relation to the training contracts, the two-year training period. There's still a two-year training period, but Whilst many students will do that in the same familiar way, there's now a possibility to combine up to four different six month periods of legal experience 
to qualify as your two year training period. So for example, for a student who struggles to find one two year role, they could combine periods of paralegal or other legal work experience, which would have to be under the supervision of an English solicitor, but they could combine all of that to meet the two year training requirement in a more flexible way. And then at the end of two years, they're qualified solicitors. Now, all of this change you can imagine has taken a lot of planning. It's been several years in the making, but overall, what we can say it represents is a more flexible route for Indian applicants who are not qualified lawyers in India to look at different ways of progressing through to the solicitor's profession in England. So I'll just have a look now at a couple of the questions that have come through about this. I've had a question come through in the chat. I think it's come through just to panelists. So I'll repeat the question is, is SQE optional if your legal undergraduate degree is in English? Um, no, the SQE will be a required component for anyone that wants to qualify as a solicitor in England. For everyone, wherever they were educated in England or outside, the SQE is the, the test that everyone has to do. And that's actually why it's been introduced, because before that, there were, there were many different processes um, of, of qualifying. And it was recognised that some of those processes might be easier than others. So the idea now is that everyone does the SQE um, in order to qualify. As a solicitor and I've had a, a comment come through as well uh, in the chat asking about the position of those who are qualified lawyers in India as I'll go on to explain the SQE is also required there and on my next slide I'll explain the position for qualified applicants but for now I'll just see if any questions have come through um, about the um, process So there are a few so, questions to the Q&A. Yeah, so there's quite a few we'll come through to in the q and I've just had a quick skim through them. And um, I'll, I'll answer a couple of them quickly. So um, we, we've got a question um, from Sumati um, who, who says they're not a law graduate. Would they be eligible to, to pass through the SQE route? Yes, you potentially would be as long as your degree meets certain requirements. There are requirements for the degree, but it doesn't have to be a law degree. And in response to the question that's arisen about the procedure after completing a degree from India, it would be the same. So you, you are able with your degree from India, potentially, as long as that degree meets certain requirements to pursue the SQE route to qualification as a solicitor. Now, um, other questions have come through about doing a LLM in the UK and the LLM in the UK as I'll go on to explain will be useful but it doesn't actually meet prerequisites needed for the LPC or SQE so it's a really useful qualification and a lot of employers will be looking for an LLM from an international applicant but if you like it's not an essential to go through the SQE process. So, um, and if I just answer one final question about whether a UK LLM is a course of English legal qualification. So for the LPC process, the, an LLM on its own wouldn't be sufficient. You would, you would need the full undergraduate um, law degree. So we'll come back to some of those other questions a bit later on, but I think some of the slides that I've got coming up will answer those questions. If I just summarize what we've got for now though, basically what we're saying is that if you're someone who is not qualified as a lawyer in India, you might want to look at the solicitor route, which now we've got the SQE is more open to you as someone without an English legal qualification. And as we move on, I'll be talking about employability in the UK and what employers are actually looking for. And that's often where the masters will come in. So now let's look at the position of those who are qualified in India. So this is for those who are qualified advocates in India. There previously has been a transfer process called the Qualified Lawyers Transfer Scheme, whereby those who are qualified Indian advocates with experience are able to transfer across and have their qualifications recognised to enable practice in England. That would involve, though, doing a number of different assessments. 
Now, what the Solicitors Regulation Authority are trying to do is, as I said, bring everyone under the same regime. So you don't get different lawyers from different backgrounds coming into the profession through different routes. So the idea now is that the Qualified Lawyers Transfer Scheme is going. In fact, it's ending this year. So if you haven't already embarked on that, that wouldn't be a suitable avenue to investigate at this stage. It's too late for that now. Instead, what you would be doing is the solicitor's qualifying exam, the SQE. So basically everyone, whether or not you've, you've, you're a qualified advocate, will be doing the SQE. Now, if you are qualified in India, there's a possibility there might be exemptions available to you from certain parts of the SQE. So there might be a bit less of it that you have to do, but that would all depend on your individual circumstances. Um, so I'm not able to offer detailed guidance on that because it's very specific to the individual. But I think the important point to recognize is now there's this expectation that everyone does the SQE. And that's really why it was brought in so that we know that everyone coming into the legal profession as a solicitor has gone through the same qualification. Everyone has met that same level, wherever they started off, wherever in the world, whatever qualifications they did previously, it's the same pathway in. So I hope that helps with just setting the scene a bit for the qualification process. And you can see it's become the same now for everyone. So let me now talk about the different routes that could be available to you. Let's imagine you're an Indian applicant and you want to seek a role in a UK law firm or working as a UK solicitor. How would you do that? The role will vary, the route will vary depending on your position. So starting off with qualified lawyers, you would need to seek a role for a qualified lawyer and then cross qualify. And usually that's most possible if your experience is in commercial areas. Obviously, commercial law has quite a lot of similarities worldwide, whereas things like criminal law or family law are very specific to each country. And there wouldn't be that much demand for an internationally trained lawyer in more specific fields. But in commercial law, a lot of employers will value Indian lawyers who have high quality existing commercial experience in India, who could support work being done for Indian clients or with an Indian focus, maybe in the UK, maybe in international legal hubs like Dubai, or in Indian offices of law firms that, well, in, in, in Indian legal environment working with say UK based clients there's a number of opportunities for you potentially as a an English qualified solicitor with Indian experience so if you were looking to go through that route what would you need as I said it would generally be commercial experience with a well-known employer this is also where the LLM is useful a lot of employers will be looking for someone who has an English legal qualification of some sort that need not be a full degree but often the LLM is a helpful starting point in, in that it's a one-year program in the UK it does help to show knowledge of the English legal system that someone who'd maybe only studied outside the UK wouldn't have. In terms of finding those opportunities I would say it's very much a case of looking online and looking at for example, the, the websites of different law firms, and I'm, I'll make some suggestions to you of appropriate law firms. Some specifically have roles that are targeted towards lawyers with experience in other worldwide jurisdictions, such as India. Also, much qualified lawyer recruitment tends to happen through recruitment agencies. A, a lot of roles aren't advertised externally initially. The, it is the agency who identifies candidates. So it often takes quite a bit of research and networking to find opportunities. But if you have the quality commercial experience, and particularly if you have a, a UK legal qualification, you are often in a good position to, to seek out roles of this sort for qualified lawyers. If you were not a qualified lawyer in India, and you were seeking a training role in the UK, you would need to seek a training contract through the usual graduate routes. Now, being quite realistic here, this will be quite difficult without a UK legal qualification. If you're someone who hasn't studied a programme, be it at LLB or LLM in England, um, most employers will prefer to recruit from those that have already got some form of English legal qualification. 
that's not to say it isn't possible. I imagine if you were a, a student from a, a top Indian law school who had outstanding grades and clearly had a great amount to offer, you could be in a position to apply directly through graduate schemes. But I would say it will be a competitive process, particularly if you've not studied in the UK, because obviously there's a, a large number of UK applicants applying for the same vacancies who already have English degrees and experience. But you can see there are a couple of different routes there, potentially, depending on your situation. So when you come to look at English legal employers, what sort of factors will you be looking at? My starting point I would suggest for you as Indian lawyers is looking for an international focus. Your experience will most be of interest and your skills and connections will most be of interest to employers who operate in the international arena, maybe working with Indian clients and businesses. Also think about practice areas, as I've said, it's generally commercial practice areas that are most transferable. Thinking about location, London is the big center of international business, but equally there are other international hubs like Dubai where you can work as an English solicitor. Also think about what sort of size of firm and what kind of culture you want. Stereotypically, if you're working in the British office of an American law firm, that will be quite a high intensity environment with very long hours. Is that what you're looking for? Or are you looking for something with a bit more of a work-life balance? And do also consider the firm's requirements. Firms will make often very clear what qualifications they're looking for and what type of experience will be interesting to them. So a few factors to consider there in researching employers. Now, I thought it'd be helpful if I just gave a bit of an overview now of some of the key employers in the solicitor's profession in the UK, because I mean, I completely understand myself when I look at different international jurisdictions that I'm not that familiar with. Sometimes I'm not quite sure who the, the key well-known recruiters and firms are. So I wanted to give you a little overview of some of the firms that you might be looking at. And a lot of this will be focused on London because this is where the biggest law firms and those that do most of the international work are based. So within the legal profession in the UK, we have what, firstly what are called the magic circle firms. And those are the five really big prestigious firms. And you can see those list, listed on the left of this slide. They're very international firms. And the numbers in brackets are the number of training contract vacancies approximately that each of those firms has every year. So that's for students who aren't yet qualified. For example, Linklater's test on around 100 students every year to train them up as lawyers. And, and a few of those students will be from India every year. Obviously for qualified lawyers, the numbers can vary from year to year depending on demand. But you can see we're looking at very big numbers of recruits there. Then alongside the magic circle, we have what we call the silver circle, which is again, very prestigious international law firms. And you can see the five firms in the silver circle along with their recruitment numbers there. So if you're looking at these firms, what are the factors to take into account? Well, there's lots of information available. All of them have excellent recruitment websites, so the information is readily available to you. All of these firms work purely in the commercial sphere. They offer very high salaries, but equally an intense work environment. You will not be going there for an easy working life. You will generally be working quite long hours. They are very competitive firms to get into, so they will be looking for individuals with excellent experience as qualified lawyers or as potential trainee lawyers, those with the very highest academic credentials. But because of their international work, as I say, they are generally very open to international applicants. Looking at other options, there's many other large London firms as well, which I've listed on the slide. And then increasingly American law firms are opening up in London as such a, a big international legal hub often with some fewer training opportunities, but you can see I've listed some of the key ones there. Many of the considerations there will be the same as the, those that I just set out for the magic and silver circle. Um, what I would say is that American law firms are known for the most intense work environment of all. They are generally very long working hours. You'd be looking at in an American firm, but equally the highest salaries of all. Then outside of London, you've got 
the regional law firms, and I've given you some particular examples on the slide. Again, these are when we're looking at the largest firms, these are generally mostly commercially focused. And they might be open to international applicants when they, they undertake quite a profile of work, but they do also like applicants with local connections. For example, in the case of a couple of these firms that have a strong Birmingham presence, they like applicants from University of Birmingham who can clearly show some commitment and experience of being in the city previously. Just for the sake of balance, I've also listed a few firms who have mixed practice areas, so not only commercial practice areas, but there aren't that many large firms that are non-commercial. Then outside of those really big, well-known firms that I've highlighted, there are thousands of law firms throughout the UK that operate in a whole range of other areas from commercial through to criminal, family, immigration and so on. Some of these firms might be actually quite large, others might just be one person running a law firm on their own. Because of their generally smaller size, these law firms won't have such extensive information available on them. Some of them won't have websites. So a good place to find out more is the Law Society's website, Find a Solicitor. If you just look at that website, you can type in different locations and practice areas and it brings up different firms and gives you information about them. All of those firms will be looking for different things, but I can say that generally it will be harder for an international applicant in a small firm, particularly if the work they're doing is very UK based, such as criminal law or family law, for example. Um, it's quite unlikely they would be looking to recruit someone who hadn't got experience in the UK sector. And that's obviously different from the larger commercial firms where they're doing very high value international work, where the international experience is viewed with a premium value. Also bear in mind there are other opportunities as well. It's not just the law firms. There are now many accountancy firms who offer legal services and legal training opportunities, and those are becoming increasingly popular with students. We also have a number of government legal opportunities, although for those you would normally need legal qualifications from the UK first. Additionally, many in-house business legal departments offer training and legal work opportunities. So really there's a huge wealth of different options available that you can research. And I've listed on this slide a number of different websites that you can use to find out more about the legal profession and start to research different UK and international employers and their requirements. We'll come back to that slide in a bit and I'll talk through some of those sources if time permits, but I'm quite keen to just have a look at some of the questions that have been asked. So I can see, see quite a number of questions. Um, in, in this instance, I'm, I might call, well, I'm having a read through them. If I can call on any assistance from, from um, my colleague Ben or equally um, Lorsico at this point, any particular questions that anyone spotted that might be helpful for us to answer? Um, so I think there's, there's quite a few. I've been trying to respond to a few as we've been going as well. Um, but I think there's a, a bit of clarity from the, from people asking around people who are already qualified in India, what they actually need to do. Because I know we did cover it with the slide before, but I think there's a, a bit of uh, confusion. So maybe a bit of clarity on what a prof practicing professional lawyer in India needs to do to, to be qualified and working here, I think is a, a good one to cover. Yeah, absolutely. So... If you forget everything you knew or may have heard about the qualified lawyer system, because that is being phased out. So it's, it's too late to start that now, but it, it would essentially be the SQE. You would need to have a look on the SRA. That's the Solicitors Regulation Authority website. And there's quite a lot of information there about the solicitors qualifying exam and how it applies to international applicants. So you would have a look at that information. You might consider whether your experience qualifies you for any exemptions, but I can tell you as the general view, most international applicants do end up doing most of the, are, are likely to have to do most of the SQE um, that, that's required. And you would then be looking at first the SQE one, which is the multiple choice test, which can be done remotely. That can be done from outside the UK with often a, a preparation course that you, that you can do online to assist you with passing that exam. It's an entirely multiple choice exam covering all the fundamental areas of English law. And then 
following on from that, you would be doing SQE2, which is the skills based assessments where you you could do some training online. but Ultimately, you would need to come to the UK to complete those assessments over a couple of days. And then if you've completed all of that, subject to various other requirements around your experience and your your character and so on, you can qualify for admission as a solicitor in the in the UK. But to get the detailed information, I would have a look at the SRA, Solicitors Regulation Authority website, and there's a specific section on there for international applicants. Also, the Law Society website, the, the English Law Society, also has a section on the SQE for international applicants. And if you've got those, the S, if, well, basically, if, you're, if you pass all those assessments, you potentially can be recognised as a qualified lawyer in the UK. Now, that's part of it. The next bit, though, is what opportunities can come from being a qualified lawyer, because it's one thing to say you're a qualified solicitor, but another to actually find a role that ut utilises that status to the maximum. And I suppose there, there's a number of options. One could be continuing to work in India, but on the basis that being a dual qualified lawyer with an English legal qualification could enhance your career. The other could be looking to work in the UK and seek a UK position, or maybe particularly in Dubai and some other international business destinations, there is a call for dual qualified solicitors with dual in English and Indian qualifications. And, and really the extent to which that's possible does depend on the quality of your experience and what you've practiced in, what you could bring to the firm. And, and as I've said, really, the LLM is often quite sought after. A lot, a lot of employers will, will be looking for some form of English qualification. So even though you don't need, for example, LLM to do the SQE, it, it often is something that can help to show experience of English law beyond passing the SQE as a, as a, as a starting point for, for the career. So I think there's a number of different options on top of the SQE and, and what's suitable for you will depend on what your experience is to date, what kind of career you would want to have. But overall, I think we can recognize the SQE does open things up and I suppose there are increasing opportunities. Something I should also add to this, which I think is a new dimension, which, which will benefit all Indian applicants is that the UK government is changing the visa rules, which will make it more flexible for students who want to come and work in the UK. In particular, um, anyone that does a master's degree or an undergraduate degree potentially qualifies for a two-year post-study work visa. That didn't apply before, and that could make it difficult for someone who, let's say, was looking to stay on in the UK in practice to, to gain experience because it was a, a difficult barrier for some students to get that working visa. But now, if you say do an LLM, you have the potential for the two year working visa, which opens up a lot of opportunity with employers. They know that you potentially have that visa and it makes it easier to take on legal employment. Thanks, Paul. I think that should hopefully uh, <laughs> clarify a few things. So there's another kind of batch of questions which are quite, are quite useful, which is around um, the UK LLM and to what aspects that will help students kind of get a job and, and integrate into the UK legal system? Yeah, absolutely. That's a great, great question from those that have asked it. So I think there's a couple of levels. First of all, it's in, in relation to the law that you studied. Obviously, there is a lot of linkage between the English and Indian legal systems, but being able to say that you've studied law in the UK and you've completed studies and assessments in a UK law school like Birmingham, for example, will be seen as desirable. And from the point of view of employers, they have more understanding of what you'll have studied and the level that you, you will have met. So for example, if you can say you have a distinction on an LLM from a university like Birmingham, that will be attractive to employers as it shows that you have an experience of English law and knowledge of English law to a high standard. It's not just the academic side though. Coming and doing a law qualification in the UK is firstly an academic experience, but there's a lot more to it in terms of networking and professional experience. So, for example, at Birmingham Law School, we have a centre called Kepler, which is our centre for professional legal education and research, where we run a whole range of activities to support your learning from a non-academic perspective. So that can include things like careers and networking events providing you with all the careers information that you need. 
We have a mentoring program, work experience opportunities. We have advocacy training. Um, for those who come on our undergraduate programs, there can be pro bono voluntary legal opportunities. So by doing the LLM in the UK, you also gain those wider experiences and skills that many employers will be looking for, which add value to your qualification. I would say the combination of the studies plus the wider experiences do help to make you more employable in the UK market and really just give you greater awareness of what, what's being looked for. Um, sitting at the end of a computer, researching vacancies, trying to network is quite difficult. So many students find a real advantage to being in the UK, even just for a year for LLM, to get that master's degree and then look at the opportunities that it opens up for them. And it, it's quite a common theme for our master's degree students that um, some of them will look to stay in the UK. And we've had many students over the years who've completed their master's and then moved on to a UK legal career. Equally many who've taken the master's and then used it more internationally in different ways as well. Brilliant. Thanks again, Paul. So there's another interesting question, which I think is related to students who've already got a, an LLB degree from, from somewhere um, and uh, potentially looking to qualify. So it's around the SRA saying that they'll still be able to take the old route up until 2032 um, if, if they want. So I don't know if there's any kind of clarity you can, you can give around that. Yes. So um, it would have to be um, an in so if we're talking about an English law degree, um, that the, there is still the potential to take the old route, which is the LPC, followed by the two year training period. Um, although that's a technical possibility, my view is that although in theory that's possible, in time, probably quite quickly over a couple of years, we will see most people looking to do the SQE. So for example, for the coming 12 months, all of the big employers are still getting their future recruits to do the LPC whilst that's available. But beyond that, everyone's moving over to the SQE, even though the LPC is a technical possibility. So for someone looking to work in the UK, you would probably want to bring your qualifications in line with what the legal sector is asking for and in five years time people won't really be doing the LPC so I'd say for the next year or two the LPC remains a viable option but beyond that we'll see most people going through the SQE process even if the LPC remains a technical possibility. Brilliant thanks again Paul so there's, there's still a lot of questions coming through um, that, we, that we're trying to get through and um, there is one question around the similarities between English law and Indian law um, and kind of how could, can an LLM bridge that gap as well, or, or if there is even a gap there? Yeah, yeah I, th I think there is a great deal of similarity, obviously, with the Commonwealth links between India and England. There, there are considerable similarities, but also some quite big differences. And while, whilst I'm, I have to admit to not having very detailed knowledge of English law, um, areas like torts and contracts, I believe, are more similar than, than some other areas. And, and really that's where the LLM helps. It enables you to gain more appreciation of the similarities. So you can appreciate more what you know already that's useful, but then equally some of the areas that are very different, you, you gain exposure to as well, and you, you get introduced to whole new legal regimes. Um, the, the LLM, I would say at Birmingham, for example, does also cover a lot of international perspectives. So we have courses you can complete within the LLM around things like um, international business law, um, international human rights and so forth, looking at the international legal system. So it, it isn't only English law focused and you, you leave with that really rounded view of worldwide legal systems and also how maybe your existing Indian legal knowledge fits into the broader international picture, which, which is what employers are often looking for. All right, so I think there's another kind of branch of questions here, which is all around timelines. So when people should be doing the SQE, when they should be applying for training contracts and can they do that kind of simultaneously at the same time or is there kind of a set process that they have to go through? So the timescales I would say vary increasingly, but there are repeated opportunities to do the SQE. There'll, there'll, there'll be at least two opportunities in terms of dates per year and more as it gets more established to complete the SQE. But most students will be doing a preparation course of some type. And what we're seeing is that um, the preparation course providers are often having multiple entry points depending on the type of course that you want to do. So I would say it's just a case of going online and looking at different course entry dates for the SQE and seeing what they are, what would fit in with you and how those links and dates. 
then looking at when you apply for training contracts, there are fairly definite windows for this. If we're looking at the big firms, so the firms that I was giving you names of on the slide, most of the recruitment for this year is largely already happened. They recruit quite far in advance, usually two years ahead of start date. And the recruitment for um, 2023 has been largely initiated in the autumn period. So, for example, of the Birmingham Law School students, quite a lot of them have already got summer internships and opportunities lined up for this summer, which will then likely lead to job offers for them to start in two years time. It's normally a two year lead in period. There, there is some flexibility with some employers around that, but it's again, one of these things that takes quite a lot of research. So if I just now look with you at some of the resources that I've flagged up, if you're not familiar with UK legal practice beyond what I've covered in this presentation, a really good website to look at is lawcareers.net. That's one very widely used by law students and it gives details of key employers, deadlines and the sorts of processes you'd be going through. Once you've had a look at that, you might then want to have a look at Legal 500 or Chambers and Partners, which go into more detail around big law firms and the sorts of work they do and the type of work environment and, and prestige and ranking and so on. So, so those are probably the best ones to start with. But I say to every student, including the, the students I teach at Birmingham Law School, it, it is quite a large research task. So it's great that you're here for this presentation today to start off the process of thinking about the opportunities, but it will then take quite a long time online looking at how your situation fits in, what you could be applying for and timescales for following through the different steps that we've been talking about. You do need to be very organized though. They're, they're often quite tight application deadlines. And if you miss them in one year with a particular firm, you then have to wait another 12 months for that opportunity to come up again. So being planned and organized is a key tip that I would give you. Thanks, Paul. So uh, just to say as well, we've had quite a few questions around the visa implication and, and how the working visa works. And I've just put a link in the chat um, back to the British Council because they're much better and, and have kind of that legal expertise around the visa process um, than we do. But Paul, I don't know if there's anything you wanted to add around the kind of post-work study visa. Um, I suppose the only thing I'd say is it, it is designed to be a fairly straightforward process and it does open up a lot more work opportunities. There are no restrictions on the type of job that you can do over those two years. Previously, there were rules about the level of salary and so forth. But for example, now one common route into a, a qualified legal role in the UK is to gain a paralegal job. And those have often, well, they weren't covered by previous visas that were available. Whereas now you can go from studying a law course in the UK to a two-year work visa, which would enable you to take on a paralegal job, which a lot of students use as a stepping point to a, a qualification or a training role. So I'd, I'd say it really opens up a lot of opportunities, both with the SQE and the visa changes. Brilliant. So I think we, we've answered quite a lot of questions. There's some very specific ones um, in the chat, um, which hopefully we can either get to, or, or if not, there'll be some contact details at the end that, that people can get to. Um, so I don't know if there's anything else, Paul, you want to, to pull out. Um, I think for me, that probably covers the main general information I was going to give. And I know we've answered quite a few of the questions. Ben, do you want to take over and just go through a few slides that I know you've got? Whilst I just continue looking at questions and I might try and pick out a couple of others that would be really good to try and answer before we finish. Yes, that sounds like a good plan to me. So I'll just quickly share my screen. Okay. So hopefully... Um, hopefully you can see that screen that just popped up there that says Birmingham in India. So I just want to do a really sort of a uh, bit of general information for you about um, the law school and the University of Birmingham and, and our kind of relationship and connection to, to India. So um, one thing you might have heard if you've jumped into one of our previous webinars uh, is around our India Institute, which is our partnership uh, and our actual physical office that we have in, in India. Um, so it's a really great opportunity for, for us to kind of build bridges, build connections and and part of that has seen a 50% increase in partnerships with, with India, with Indian organisations such as uh, Law Sikha, who we've been working with uh, very closely now for the last few months. Um, and also just to kind of remind everybody, the University of Birmingham is an approved university by the Bar Council of India as well. So really exciting things happening that we've had going on for the last few years, but we've really kind of seen our connections and our, uh, our relationships develop really closely with India and something we're, we're continuing to, to push for as well. Um, one of the big things that comes with that is that we actually have people who work for the University of Birmingham um, based in India as well. 
Um, so I've just put some contact details on here, which is for our in-country manager, Nidhi. Um, she's a fantastic resource for, for any questions you have about studying with the University of Birmingham, whether that's in law or, or in any other subjects as well. Um, we've got a bespoke page on our website where you can go to, which has links to all our agents as well. So if you've got general questions about the university, uh, Nidhi's a great contact to go to, but if you're looking for support on how to apply or, or anything to kind of transition through that process, then our agents are a really great uh, resource to support you with that as well. Um, so please do, do get in, in touch with us and reach out. We're, we're really happy to, to help that. And, and also as soon as we can be, uh, we'll be back visiting India as well and visiting some of the fairs and opportunities that come up across the year. So the kind of exciting thing that I did just want to share with you is around some of the scholarships we have uh, available for this year's entry. Uh, I can only talk about uh, 2021 because at the moment everything's changing so quickly um, that things may change. But for this year, we have a, a, a huge range uh, of exciting scholarships available to, to students. So uh, for those who are looking for an undergraduate degree for that LLB at Birmingham, we're offering uh, up to £3,000 as fee waivers uh, for five international students who join us on our programmes for this year. Uh, at postgraduate level, so for our LLM, uh, we have a £5,000 fee waiver as part of our Harding International Legal Scholarship. Um, and for a bit more insight onto that, about two weeks ago, we did a session with some of our alumni, uh, one of which was uh, a recipient of that scholarship uh, from India. So really great connections there already. Uh, we also have a range of arts and law scholarships, which link through to the master's programme as well. And that's up to £10,000 as a fee waiver for you. Uh, and one of the most exciting things that I think is coming to Birmingham in the coming years and, and months is the Commonwealth Games, which you may be aware of. Uh, and as part of that, any postgraduate uh, applicant for, from India who comes to Birmingham will automatically receive a £3,000 fee waiver off their, off their fees just for, for being from part of the Commonwealth countries which we're celebrating with uh, for 2022. Uh, and then the final one links to a Global Masters Award, which is a much more um, competitive award because it's across the entire university, uh, but that's again up to £10,000 of fee waivers uh, for students from India as well. Uh, so the majority of our, our opportunities are for postgraduate study at the moment, um, but we do always retain that LLB and LLB for graduates scholarship opportunity as well. So I think Paul might have had a bit of a chance now to have a look through some of the last remaining questions. So I'm just going to leave this slide up for a second. And this is our contact details back in the law school. So if you do have any questions based on anything we've said today or anything you'd like to follow up with, uh, please do use the emails there. So there's an LLB email for an undergraduate or, or a postgraduate for, with the LLM. Um, but if you email both of them, they come to the same place. So we can certainly respond to any questions you have there. Uh, and please do check out our website online as well. Um, so, Paul, I'll open it back up. Was there anything you wanted to kind of come back in on? Yeah, just just a couple of points I've picked out the questions. Um, a clarification, first of all, I can see that quite a lot of the questions relate to LLM, LPC or MA law and so on. So just to ensure that you're looking at the right university, because some of those are not programmes that the University of Birmingham offers. Um, you can see on the slide that Ben's currently showing our web address. It's birmingham.ac.uk rather than I think maybe a couple of the universities that some of you have been looking at. And just to explain the programme that we have, it is a Russell Group, so a prestigious master's degree in law, the LLM in both Birmingham campus and Dubai campus. It's not a programme that enables you to then go on and study the LPC. Instead, what it's designed for is students who are looking to add a qualification from a high profile Russell Group University to their portfolio to give them something appealing to offer to employers in terms of getting a training contract and then hopefully progressing through the SQE process. So the master's doesn't count towards that process, but it does give you something on your portfolio that will be in demand from employers as a Russell Group University. It does though also open up to you the two year post-study work visa which is desirable and some um, linking to a couple of questions, the paralegal work that you might do under that visa can potentially count towards your two year training period if you're going through the, LP, um, the SQE regime. So that paralegal work can, can be used for that purpose as well. We had a question about the rights of audience of English solicitors. Traditionally, rights of audience in the highest courts has been reserved to barristers. That was one of the appeals of the barristers profession. But if you are a solicitor who specializes in advocacy, you can do what's called a higher rights qualification, which does give you opportunities to appear in, in some of the higher courts as well. 
there were a couple of questions around the syllabus for the SQE. What I'd suggest you do is have a look on the SRA, Solicitors Regulation Authority website, where there's very detailed information about the full syllabus and the areas that you, you need to cover for that. And then as a final point, some of you were asking around how to appeal to employers, what employers are looking for and how placements would fit into that. So if we're looking at the kind of prestigious employers who recruit to the well-known London or international law firms, they will be looking for an excellent academic profile. So amongst, for example, our University of Birmingham students, it will tend to be the high performing students with good academic results that get those roles. And also those that are able to demonstrate a range of other skills and experiences. So maybe they've been involved in extracurricular activities or part-time work, which show the sorts of skills that those employers are looking for. Now, we know that that's quite an ambitious target for a lot of people. So in the law school, we do really support you. I mentioned Kepler, where we have all of these different networking and information opportunities to help you build up the right skills. So, for example, this evening, I'm running a Kepler career session with two of our alumni that just finished last year, where they're going to be going through their experiences of gaining roles at Magic Circle law firms and giving the students information on how to complete their application successfully so that they can hopefully follow in the track of our successful alumni. Additionally, there's placement opportunities, competition opportunities for things like interviewing, negotiation, debating. So if you do all of those things alongside your studies, it really helps to enhance your employability as well. And you can demonstrate the skills and experiences that employers are looking for. So in summary, just be assured that the Birmingham course is very well known. If you chose to come and study with us, there would be a high quality academic qualification added to your experience but alongside that a lot of other networking and professional opportunities that will enhance your employability as well. So I think from my point of view that's everything that I wanted to cover bearing in mind the time we did say it was an hour long webinar I'm conscious I haven't quite got to all the questions so I'm sorry if I haven't managed to answer your question directly but I hope that the information I've given has been helpful and as Ben said you've got our contact email addresses there so please don't hesitate to get in contact. Thank you for joining us today, wishing you all the best in your future career endeavours and hopefully we might see some of you at Birmingham Law School before too long. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for the webinar today it was you there was really good engagement and you've been able to answer all the questions i'm sure it was an insightful uh, discussion today thank you uh, so much a pleasure. thank you for hosting us it's been really nice to see you all and, and thank you to to all the um lawyers and students who joined us for for the discussion it's been really good Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Ben. We'll be in touch. Thank you so much. If there is any specific questions which comes our way, I'm going to send it to Ben. That's wonderful. Thank you for all the support. Thanks. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Bye-bye.